Before class ended last semester, my wife had suffered a stroke, and uh, her typing skills are still not up to par. And uh, Sister Cunningham, I appreciate so much her offering a little bit ago to type for me this semester some, if need be. And, uh, but my wife typed what we have tonight, but she, it took her a good while to do it. But it's good therapy for her, really, uh, that she's kind of getting her hand-eye coordination back. And uh, so but I appreciate so much your prayers for her. And uh, she is making progress. And we're just so thankful uh, that it could have been a whole lot worse. And one of our daughters has had surgery over the holidays, and uh, both the lumps that were removed were benign. And we are so grateful that could have been so different, too. So God is good, and uh, he's good all the time, no matter what happens in our life. And let's always remember that. But our class, this last class each week, will have to do with Bible greats. On the first page there, you see 17 Bible greats that I have listed. And the first that we will notice is the great God. And uh, I will allude to those verses when we get on the next page. We will talk about the great Savior. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Before he was born... The angel said in Luke 1, 32, that he shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. Near the last verses of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, 20, he is referred to as the great shepherd of the sheep. We'll notice the great salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Hebrews 2, 3. We'll notice the great invitation. I know you think in Matthew 11 where Jesus said, Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, you don't find the word great. In Luke chapter 14 and verse 16, an invitation to the world referred to as a great supper. A great invitation. We'll talk about God's great promises. 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. Whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises. We'll talk about God's great love, Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he hath loved us. We'll talk about great faith. I love those statements that are made in Matthew 8, Matthew 15, Luke chapter 7. It's interesting that both of these accounts, uh, one of them is referring to the same account, the one in Matthew and the one in Luke, Matthew 8 and Luke 7. But both of these, the Lord makes a statement to a Gentile. And he said, I've not seen so great faith, no, not in Israel. And on the other, he said, O oh, woman, great is thy faith. We'll talk about the great reward, Matthew 5 and verse 12. Great is your reward in heaven. We'll talk about great commandments, Matthew 22, verse 37. The great, first and great commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. We'll talk about God's great word. Psalm 119, verse 162 said, in reference to the word of God, finding it was finding great spoil. And oh, how great is God's word. We'll talk about the great price, the pearl of great price. Matthew 13, the precious church of our Lord. 1 Peter chapter 3 talks about that humble woman, wife, the Bible says in the sight of God, it's great price. Think about great joy. That song a while ago had to do with that great joy. And uh, you just think about the joy that we have in Christ. Boy, isn't it just wonderful to be here tonight, rejoice in the Lord, and you think about all those folks you wish were here. If you're down in Disney somewhere, you might get a text from somebody or somebody down there, and they might send you a text, they wish you were here. I wish folks were here. And uh, we could kind of expand the tables on out a little bit more toward the wall. Uh, but great joy, great peace. My, think about the peace that passeth understanding. Psalm 119, verse 165. The Bible says, great peace have they that love thy law. We'll talk about great people. Matthew 18, Jesus talked about humble people, and servants in Matthew 20. He said, these are my greatest people. You know, a lot of people think they have a wrong standard about greatness. 
The Lord's term for greatness is humility and service. We'll talk about that great day. Jude talked about it in Jude verse 6. It was referred to as a great day. We sing about it. There's a great day coming. And that day is coming. And it surely is coming because the Lord said it would. Acts 4.33 refers to great grace. And Luke chapter 10 verse 2 says, The harvest is great. The laborers are few. So those are, we'll not be able to hit all those probably. Uh, but we will be trying to get to most of them. And tonight we want to notice our great God. You think about the foundation pillar upon which the whole of Christianity rests is the existence of God. Daniel said in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 28, there is a God in heaven. And I'm telling you, every one of us here tonight, we rest, I mean everything uh, about our lives. It's upon that great eternal truth. There is a God in heaven. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 14, verse 1. Psalm 53, verse 1. In 1 Thessalonians 1, and verse 9, Paul said, They had turned from idolatry to serve the living and true God. And you think about that beautiful passage. Deuteronomy 33, 27. I followed a man at Double Springs by the name of Stubby George. Stubby died, and I'm already eight years older than Stubby does when he died. He died at age 59 and died of colon cancer. His favorite verse was Deuteronomy 33 and verse 27. The eternal God is our refuge and our strength and underneath of the everlasting arms. Psalm 19 verse 2, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. We've sung songs tonight, How Great Thou Art. And think about that old hymn, Our God, He is Alive. Winfred Clark was the preacher that I heard preach this sermon in that C, uh, D part. And if you want a sermon about God, work up a sermon on these five thoughts. God is the God of the second chance. He's the God of the fourth generation. In Genesis 15, it talks about the fourth generation. It talks about the faithfulness of God. He is the God of the, of the fifth sparrow. My dad, I've been in an old log truck with my dad, and uh, maybe we would stop. And if you've never had two pigs in a tow sack in a log truck, uh, you need to experience that at some point. Uh, but he might stop, and, and uh, he thought he knew where somebody maybe had a litter of pigs and he was about out of pigs and he'd want to stop and buy some pigs. And uh, he would bargain with them, you know, and they'd have maybe a runt. Some of you don't even know what a runt is probably, but you, know, you probably need to. Uh, but dad would say, well, will you throw that runt in? I mean, he, he wasn't worth much and uh, you ought to just uh, pick them on the head, I guess. Uh, because they never would really grow off very fast, and it took a lot longer for them to top out. Uh, but that was just kind of the way the fifth spire was. It was kind of thrown in the boot. But God knows, and he knows whenever spire falls. Now, it's going to be cold enough next week. Uh, there will be a lot of spires fall, and God will kind of be busy keeping up with all of them that fall. God is the God of the eleventh hour, Matthew chapter 20. And God is the God of a thousand hills, Psalm 50. The God of a thousand hills. God owns it all, doesn't he? Well, we're made in his image, Genesis chapter 1. Um, Acts 17 and verse 29 says we're his offspring. But boy, we're a whole lot different. <laughs> and I know there's a sense where we're, we're like God. And we have an eternal spirit that is forever. But boy, I tell you what, when I compare myself to God, I guess I think in Isaiah chapter 40 that I'm like a grasshopper compared to God. If you've ever been up in a plane, and most of you have been there, and maybe you're flying just three or 4,000 feet, and you look down and maybe over I-65, and you see these tractor trailer rigs and you know they look so little and they're just kind of moving along. Can you imagine 
God sitting up there where he is looking down. And we think we're so big sometimes. Oh my, God is so much greater, so much wiser, so much more powerful, so much more holy. But we're to be like him as best we can. We're made in his image. Exodus 5 and verse 2, the Bible says there, the words of Pharaoh, Who is that God that shall deliver you? Daniel chapter 3, you remember Nebuchadnezzar basically said the same thing to Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Who is that God that will be able to deliver you from the fiery furnace? Micah 7, verse 18 and 19, Who is a God likened unto thee? Boy, pardoneth iniquity, passeth by the uh, tr uh, remnant of his heritages. He retaineth not his anger forever. He delights in mercy. Nehemiah 1 and verse 5, He is the great and terrible God, or awesome God. Psalm 104, verse 1, Thou art very great. Psalm 145 and verse 3, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And Psalm uh, 147 and verse 5, Great is our Lord and of great power. In Ephesians 1.19, the exceeding greatness of his power. Great promises. And I love the statement in Revelation 4 verse 11. For all these angels said, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive honor and glory and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy glory they were made. Now you and I, when we think of him, we might think of Job 7 and verse 11. We just think we couldn't compare ourselves to him. We, we, we can't fathom it. And Isaiah said, his ways and his thoughts are so much higher than ours as the heavens are above the earth. In Romans 11, verse 33, Oh, the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Paul said in 1 Timothy 3, and verse 16, Great is the mystery of godliness. But yet, we're to know him. John 17, 3 said, This is life eternal, that they might know thee. And John said in 1 John 2 and verses 3 and especially verse 4, Hereby do we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. And Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. But him that glorieth, let him glory in this, that he knoweth the Lord. Paul said, I know him in whom I have believed. 2 Timothy 1, 12. But even though we know him, we can't comprehend the whole. But it's sad indeed that a world doesn't know God. Exodus 5, when Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? You remember what he said after that? He said, I don't know him, and neither will I let my people go. Now, Judges 2 verse 10 says, There arose a generation that what? Knew not God. 1 Samuel 2 verse 12, it talks about Eli's sons, and it said they knew not the Lord. Job 21 and verse 14, Job referred to the wicked, and he said they desire not the knowledge of thy ways. In John 16, Jesus said people will kill you because they don't know me. And you think about it in this world, people need to know God. And we can change this world if we would change what people believe. In Romans 1 and verse 28, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And on that great day when the Lord comes back, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 to 9, vengeance will be poured out on those who know not God. So even though our knowledge of him is really, really small, we're called upon to know him and to seek to know him to the best of our abilities. There are a lot of false views of God. There's atheism, the belief that there is no God. There's deism, the belief that God created the universe and then forsook it, that he has no influence in the affairs of man and the universe. There's agnosticism that says the belief that one cannot know whether God exists or not. 
Now, he might believe that God is, but he would say you cannot know that God is. Then there's polytheism, the, the belief in many gods. And there's pantheism, which is the belief that God, you know, it's kind of like Hinduism, that God is everything and God is everywhere and, and God is in that door over there or whatever. Uh, but I want us to notice some true attributes of God for the next few minutes. Think about the sovereignty of God. The Most High, the Almighty. Genesis 17, verse 1, God said to Abraham, I am the Almighty. I mean the sovereignty of God. The only potentate, 1 Timothy 6, verse 15 and 16. I mean, He is the Most High. And there are verses that render that. Daniel chapter 4 uh, when, when Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he's, he's, he's been made to uh, be humbled. And, and I mean, it's, it's, it's a, amazing what Nebuchadnezzar says in Daniel 4, beginning in verse 35. It goes 34, it goes about through verse 38 or 39. And he talks about this great God and how that, you know, men ought to, they ought to worship him. And anybody that didn't, he was going to be opposed to them. Psalm 24 and verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the sovereignty of God. Secondly, think about the omnipotence of God. Jeremiah 32 and verse 17 says there's nothing too hard for God. Job 42 verse 2, I know that thou canst do everything. And Luke 1 verse 37, the angel said, for with God nothing shall be impossible. I have never... Work, some of you have worked in uh, strip pits or maybe underground mining. And it just blows my mind the power of some of those trucks and, and uh, cranes and loaders. I mean, wow, what power. A train. Can you imagine a train pulling all, how much weight does some of these trains pull? Think about a nuclear bomb. Think about the power of that. Think about some of the bombs that's been used over in Ukraine or over in uh, Israel. And you, you see just unbelievable power. But that's not anything compared to God's power. Revelation 19.6 says, The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. God is all powerful. Psalm 19 that we sang about tonight. You think about God's power to create the world. Can you imagine <coughs> bringing something from nothing <coughs> like what we have? I don't know how many galaxies. We're part of one galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. <coughs> Some people think there are as many galaxies as there are stars that we see. It's unreal what God has created. And God just said, let it be. And it was. And God has always been. You know, that's going to be one of our questions when we get there, I guess. How could God always have been? If God had not always been, there would never have been anything. But God is. He is eternal. He is all powerful. Think about making the human body and not just a human body think about all the little old critters that are out there in the world and all the traits that they have it is amazing I was deer hunting the other day by a big old strip pit pond and there was a pond over here and a pond over here and I'm walking up through there and I saw a trail I thought what in the world made that trail I figured it out as a beaver a beaver going from one pond to the other. And I guess he was dragging his flat tail because that trail was about that wide and it was just wore out like cows coming to the barn almost. But then there were ducks. There were ducks out there swimming on the pond and I was waiting for a deer to come out. And um, all the things that God has made. And our human body. One of my sons-in-law is an optometrist in Florence. And he spent four years at UAB, just studying basically the human eye. 
Yeah, it could tell you things about the human eye that's just unreal almost. And that's just one little part of the body. The psalmist said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wondrously made. Psalm 139, and verse 14. And God formed man, Genesis 2, verse 7, from the dust of the ground, breathed to his nostrils the breath of life. Think about the parting of the Red Sea. Joshua 10, when the sun stood still. Turning back the sun in 2 Kings 20. You know, Hezekiah said, well, you know, not too much too. You know, the sun just going down, but turn it back the other way. And God did. Think about stopping the mouths of the lions. All the miracles through Christ. The resurrection. Our God is able. We sing a song sometimes entitled, Our God is able to deliver thee. And that is so true. There are several verses there that use the word able. Think about the omniscience of God. That God knows everything. He is infinite in knowledge. He knows our thoughts. Psalm 139. You know, I was just thinking about this. How long does it take some, for some times, for all of us, probably not very long. But how long does it take for our thoughts to react into behavior? Uh, Rob's a school teacher back there, and he, he probably sees that pretty often. Uh, you think about a thought process, and how long does it take to when it's turned into something good or bad? Well, God knows when it's in the thought process. And you think about things that you've done that if you could live your life over, you'd never do them. And God knew that thought was there all along. No doubt, he's hoping you would put it to rest. But he knew it was there. Think about our words. Think about our actions. God knows it all. And we're going to give an account in the great day of judgment. There are going to be basically four books open on judgment day. There will be the Old Testament for people that lived on the Old Testament. There will be the New Testament for people that you, you and I, you and me. There will be the book of our deeds and there will be the Lamb's book of life. And God knows because God is omniscient. In Genesis chapter 6 the Bible says in the days of Noah that God knew the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. God knew it. God knew it all along. He knows our words. He's fully aware of our actions. Adam and Eve didn't, they didn't hide from God. Nadab and Abihu didn't hide from God in Leviticus 10. Uzzah didn't in 2 Samuel 6. None of the seven congregations in Revelation 2 and 3, they didn't hide from God. He's aware also of our sufferings and our sorrows and our hurts. God knows. And aren't we thankful that God knows? Think about the omnipresence of God. He is present in all places at the same time. There's no point of space, no, amount of, no moment of time where God is not present. In Psalm 139, after talking about how that God knows our thoughts and our words, he said, Whither shall I flee from thy presence? You can't go out of, into outer space and get away from God. You can't go down into the depth of the sea and get away from God. Because God is omnipresent. In Jeremiah chapter 23, some of these people thought that God was a God at hand, but not a God afar. <laughs> God's the God of the hills and God's the God of the valleys. God sees it all and God is present and we cannot get away from him. Hebrews 4 and verse 13, we're all naked and open before his eyes. He's not far from any of us, Acts 17. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. He that keepeth Israel will not slumber nor sleep, Psalm 121 and verse 4. Think about the immutability of God, the unchangeable nature of God. Malachi 3, verse 6, the prophet said, For God, I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
Hebrews 13 and verse 8. And James 1 and verse 17. With whom is no variableness. Revelation 2.10. He will keep his promises. Think about the holiness of God. My. He cannot. Habakkuk 1 and verse 13 says. He cannot look on evil. Of purer eyes than to look on sin. James chapter 1 says he cannot be tempted with evil. Now it's not that God, that you and I have some ability that he doesn't have, that we can be tempted and he can't. But in view of his nature, God cannot be tempted. He is so holy. You and I are to strive to be holy. Be ye holy as I am holy, the Lord said on numerous occasions. In Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4, there are three words in in succession. Same word. I did a sermon one time on the three word uh, times in the Bible where three words is used. Like Jeremiah 22, 29. Oh, earth, earth, earth. Hear the word of the Lord. Another one was the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. But Isaiah 6, 3 and Revelation 4, 8 is holy Holy, holy. That's another song we sing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Memphis School of Preaching several years ago had a whole lectureship entitled Lyrics. Uh, was it something? Lyrics and Songs or something? I don't remember exactly the title of it. But boy, I'm telling you, that is a great book uh, that just takes songs. And notice his lessons from those songs. I did one of those, the song entitled Yield Not to Temptation. And it is powerful to take each phrase in that song of Yield Not to Temptation. And I did the one on Holy, Holy, Holy. And the lady at Double Springs told me that she would never sing that song again uh, without it meaning a whole lot more to her. And uh, so the holiness of God. One of my favorite traits of God is the faithfulness of God. While the earth remains, Genesis 8, 22, there will be seed time and harvest, day and night, cold and heat, summer and winter, not cease from earth. I've been on earth, coming March will be 68 years. Some of you are a little older than me, but not many of you. I'm getting on up there where I'm, I'm kind of getting the top of the list. But you just think about how faithful God has been. There never has been a day in all those years that the sun, so to speak, hadn't come up. Every day. God is faithful. So many things about God's faithfulness. The righteousness and the justice of God. The mercy of God. His compassion. His loving kindness. In the 136th Psalm... I believe I might get to that, but he's going to have to skip some if he gets to 136 this semester. Every verse, 26 verses, every verse ends the same way as it talks about the mercy of God. And then all the love of God. That God has loved us with an everlasting love. He's drawn us with bands of love, Hosea said. Romans 5, four key words in Romans 5 that talks about God's love. He loved us when we were without strength, when we were helpless, we couldn't help ourselves. He loved us while we were ungodly, while we were enemies, and while we were sinners. All four of those describe me, the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John chapter 3 and verse 16. But then I want us to spend this last minute with the severity of God. Ephesians 5 and verse 6 talks about the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Luke 16. Imagine the God that gave his son to die for the world. Hearing the plea of a man for one drop of water. And the answer is no. And the answer will forever be no. 
Franklin Camp had a sermon entitled The Other Side of the Cross. And he started with Adam and Eve, and he went through the Bible. And he talked about God's wrath. God is so good to us. But when we spurn his goodness and we reject his mercy and his love and his forgiveness, being the just God that he is, and any judge who is just cannot just turn a deaf ear to sin. Sin has to be punished. And sin will either be punished through the blood of Christ, taking our punishment for us, or we'll be punished for our sin. God has no other alternative. And you think about sometimes down the stream of time when justice demanded a penalty, when goodness was spurned. And there was Adam and Eve. And there are the wicked people in the days of Noah. And there was Sodom and Gomorrah. And there were Nadab and Abihu. And there was Uzzah. And there were the children of Israel on many occasions. There was Achan and his family. There was King Solomon and King Saul and Ahab and David. There's Ananias and Sapphira. And there's that great judgment day in the future. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. Romans 11 and verse 22. The concluding part there, oh, Levi hit that with a nail on the head tonight. Psalm 1. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Psalm 46 and verse 10, be still and know that I am God. James 4 verse 8, draw nigh to God. I wrote a letter the day before yesterday, sent it to a lady who's 37 years old, who has five children who is dying of ovarian cancer. I made a visit to her about six weeks ago and she wanted to be restored to the Lord. She had strayed away from the Lord. We had prayer. I have truly believed that God has forgiven her. And in that letter that I wrote to her two days ago, I quoted James 4, verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Her closing days on this earth, her birthday is January the 26th. Her niece told me two days ago, I don't believe Kendra will make it to her birthday. But she can draw nigh to God. And God has a rich reward by his grace and his favor awaiting her. Love him with all your heart, with all your soul, your mind. Seek him first in his kingdom. Obey him and not men. And take assurance like Paul did in Acts 27 and verse 25 when he said, For I believe God that it shall be just as he hath told me. Next week, we'll look at the great Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I want to ask Brother John Hatton, if he would, to stand and lead us in a closing prayer. And I appreciate the prayer for the safety tomorrow, the Lord's mercies to be on us. I, I have a trip planned up in Lauderdale County, and one of our newest members at Double Springs, since he obeyed the gospel, has come down with cancer, multiple myeloma. And uh, he has a chemo treatment tomorrow at Kirkland Clinic. And I want us to be praying for his safety that he can get there and have that treatment and get back home. There's so many. LT, sweet wife, Joanne. Oh, me. Joanne wants to come home even more, I think, than LT wants her home. And LT wants her home desperately. And uh, so uh, there's so much for us to be praying about and loving one another and caring about. And thank you all for being here tonight. And let's conclude with the prayer of John Leeton.